Praise the Lord, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. If we could stand in the house of the Lord tonight. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because we serve the mighty God. We, we serve the living God. I don't just show up here for a good time. I don't just show up here for a feeling, but I show up here expecting help. I show up here expecting direction. I ex show up expecting to hear from God, uh, expecting direction from God, and it's exciting to me. And I'm grateful for the word of God. I'm grateful for his presence, and I'm looking forward to tonight. But we're going to open up with special prayer tonight. Um, We've already anointed this prayer cloth here, but we want to have special prayer for Tony Giss. He has a uh, mass on his stomach. Uh, they're not sure if it's cancer or not, but I would like if, if we could pray in faith together. If you'd pray with me, we're going to pray over this prayer cloth tonight for him. And we're going to pray it in the name of Jesus that it will be done, that healing will come, that, that God will inter intercede. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you humbly, knowing you are the only source of help. You are the creator, God. There's nothing too hard for you, and you are an everlasting father. God, you care for those who are sick. You care for those who are going through struggle. I just plead the blood over Tony Giss right now. I pray the name of Jesus over Tony Giss, over his situation, over his body, I anything that may come against his body under the power of the name of Jesus. I I speak healing. I speak, Lord, that, that, that his blood will flow properly. Any masses will be destroyed. I, I pray for nutrients to go through his body properly. I pray for a full healing brain, heart, lungs, blood, whatever it is, God. You're the God above it all, and I praise you for what you're doing right now. I praise you for your intercedence. God, I praise you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 In one of my devotions this morning, I read about that word amen, and it, 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 it is like when the, it was saying, when some at the end of the prayer, they say amen, it's, it, it's expected that it's done. There, there's faith that when I say amen, that it's done. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go into prayer tonight, too. Um, we want to remember Brother Skipper um, that he's not feeling good. We want to pray over him. Um, I know there's a lot of prayer. I know there's there's situations that we, we need the Lord in. I'm sure there's a lot of sickness. There's a lot of struggle mentally, physically, spiritually. But I know where my help comes from. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how to pray for everything. But I just know where my help comes from. I know when I get to an altar something can happen I know when I close the door on my prayer room and his presence comes in things change it's I just trust him I believe in him but without faith it's impossible to please him we got to have faith if you have a need tonight, would you make it known by the raising of your hand? If you believe he can touch your family, if he can touch your situation, I don't care how big it is, pray with me right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're the only one worth seeking. You're the only one worth coming after, God. It's all about your presence, God. I pray that you help us prove your perfect will in our life. God, I pray for direction to be spoken through our pastor tonight. I pray that divine words would come through our pastor but God first off stir up the fallow ground of our hearts and help us to receive it God we want to get lined up with you God you're not a gumball machine but but you are powerful you are mighty and you have every answer God and you work things for good Lord I'm praying that in the name of Jesus Christ that healings will take place in bodies that are sick bodies that are struggling Lord I, I pray over minds that are struggling with depression and anxiety God it hurts habits and hangups God I, I pray for people to get a burden to get connected to the body of Christ that healing may come Lord that may we may strengthen one another God I pray that you anoint this service tonight touch everybody in here touch everybody watching online and everybody connected under the power that's in the name of Jesus Amen So my needs will be met. You 
If he's not stopped being God, I'm not done praising. If he's still on the throne, I'm not done praising. My situation hasn't changed, but he's still on the throne. And I, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless him on, in the valley just as much in the mountaintop. Nothing's going to take my praise. That song talks not about not forgetting I, that, when that song said, I'm going to watch my God do it again, I began to look around, Brother Tripp, at everybody, and he's done it again and again. And, and if he can do it for other people, he can do it for me. If he can touch other families, he can touch mine. If he can touch other people's sickness, then he can touch ours. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to go into our giving if you'd like to be seated for just a moment. We have Giveify, PayPal, available at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madra, Missouri, 63869. And you can text to give at 833-883-9311. And we have pans for tithing and pans for offering. He's faithful. Sometimes, Brother Ronnie, I get so simple with it in prayer, you know, but I, Lord, thank you that my bills are paid. Lord, I haven't had to think about having a meal in I don't know how long, ever, ever. And, I, and it's so easy to take those little things for granted. And Brother Tripp, he's, he's never forsaken me. And it isn't nothing to give to him tonight. It isn't nothing for me to give what he's already given to me. If you'd like to stand, we're going to pray this prayer tonight, and we're going to give. And I believe it's going to be a blessing. If you believe that, why don't you pray with me? Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over, I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just one. 
Sometimes that's kind of hard to do, Brother Tripp. We sing it, we go through the motions, but sometimes it's a little hard to do. 
And one of the greatest things that I've found is when I'm struggling to believe for greater things, the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. When I begin to speak scripture over my life, when I begin to speak positive things over my life, when I begin to speak... When the, when the enemy says God's left me, no, truth is, as the mountains are round about the, are round about the Lord, or, I messed it up. As the mountains are around about Jerusalem, so the Lord is around about his people, henceforth, even forever. I begin to speak scripture, and things change. But uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You could be seated, and Riverbend kids could come forward. We're going to pray over our children tonight because it's important and their futures are important and I believe the Lord has a future for them and I believe it starts here. I believe it starts in that room back there. Why don't you stretch your hands forward tonight and let's pray over these children. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I just plead the blood over their minds right now. And whatever could come against them, whatever attacks could come against their home, Lord, I pray, I pray for a covering over their home. I pray for good godly influence in their home. I pray for, for a culture, for a soil that, that, that takes in the word of God and brings forth fruit. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that a conviction of sin come into their home, Lord. Protect them, Lord. I pray that you order their steps. Lord, I plead the blood over the teachers tonight and help them connect. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, Sister Violet, you can lead them back. River Bend ignited. Aren't we grateful for our youth? Amen. Amen. I got to know them a little bit over Youth Congress. They, they get a little more excited sometimes than what I thought. But uh, I love them. I'm grateful for them. I look forward to what the Lord has for them. And I believe they're going to do great things. And I'm grateful for Brother Richard and, and, and Brother Tripp and Sister Meredith and all of them to help out back there. I believe they're making a difference in their lives. And we're going to pray that they can continue to make a difference. So reach your hands forward. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, God, I plead the blood over our youth group. Lord, right now, I pray that you touch our teachers. Lord, I pray that the, no the words they're going to speak, I pray for them to be anointed. I pray for them to come from heaven. God, I pray that they can speak right into somebody's problem right now, right into somebody's situation, God. I pray for a faith to rise up in our youth group to go after a call, to go after souls, to Lord, to just fulfill who you've called them to be, who you want them to be. Lord, Lord, I pray for a freedom and a liberty to just be. God, I pray against pressure coming upon them that may hold them back, Lord. But Lord, cover them and cover their steps. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And we're going to turn it over to Pastor. I'm grateful for him and I look forward to what he has for us. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Do you mean it? Huh? Ain't God good? Come on a Wednesday night to the house of the Lord and just feel his presence. Amen. Come on, y'all go better connect with the brother now. Amen. I mean, I, I see some, I ain't seen it yet, but I know y'all be fanning yourself directly. And if you get to feeling too hot, just step outside for a second and then come right back in and you'll see how blessed we really are. Amen. We got about 25 degrees cooler in here than it is outside. And that's pretty good on a day when it's 95, 96, something like that. A couple announcements to make. Brother Mike Burke will be preaching for us Sunday. And uh, he's going to baptize uh, Daisy and Miley, who received the Holy Ghost about three weeks ago. And uh, it's uh, their mother is with us tonight. And we're happy for her to be here. That's right. And... Uh, uh, God is good, amen? Yes. And uh, so Brother Burke was booked up until late in October, and uh, those are his nieces, Daisy and Miley, and they're going to be baptized Sunday, and they wanted uh, Brother Burke to baptize them, which I think is wonderful. 
So uh, he's going to come baptize him, and then he's going to preach for us. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we're excited about that. I um, also want to do one other little bitty housekeeping thing, and, and don't, don't let your lips stick out. But there's a whole lot of different things that go on on the other side at different times in a lot of different rooms. And uh, with a few small exceptions, all of our teachers purchase uh, their treats, et cetera, out of their pocket. And there's been a number of situations where their treats are disappearing and are getting opened like potato chips and just left open. And that happened this week, and the, it failed every one of them. So try to watch your youngins. If they need to eat at church, bring them some groceries. Can I get a witness? With that being said, my daddy would have beat the brakes off of me <laughs> if I'd have been eating something in the church house that wasn't supposed to. Right. So uh, we're going to talk about the fear of the Lord and how you treat the house of God is included in the fear of the Lord. Right. Amen? Right. So uh, I, I hate to do that but but it because it, it's happened several times and I've kind of just let it go. And uh, I do not want to have to put locks on all of our doors. And we've already had to do that on one door, and we do not want to do that. We want this to be our church. Amen? Amen. We do not want to do that. So, and, uh, and I've given out so many keys to the sanctuary that it just will. Sometimes it does stay open several days in a row. But uh, I'm excited. We, we have cars here almost seven days a week. People are here active, and that's what we want. Amen? Amen? Amen. Um, last week we ran into a little bit of a moral, ethical buzzsaw with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Um, their desire to be to appear totally committed without being totally committed to the point that they lied unbeknownst to them. They lied to God, and as a result, they lost everything, including their lives. And we struggled with that a little bit, and we, I admit to you that I've struggled with it, but tonight we're going to answer some of those questions. And at the very least, we're going to offer some food for thought, which will hopefully lead to an increased awareness of the magnitude of what we're really doing when we make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. There is a big difference in joining a church and following Jesus Christ. You can go to church six days a week and twice on Sunday and still not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Right. Going to church by itself doesn't save you. Okay? We need an increased awareness of the magnitude of what we are doing and who we are becoming when we make the decision to follow Jesus Christ. And that is a decision that is incomplete, inadequate, and lacking in power unless it's accompanied by the highest respect, awe, and reverence for God, which we are calling, and the Bible calls, the fear of the Lord. We have to have it. We have to have it. Now, we generally, as has been our practice, we open the floor throughout the Bible study for comments and questions, etc., Tonight, we're not going to do that like we've always done it. We, we have offered each of you a handout uh, upon which, do we have enough for everybody? Uh, do we have very many extras? Yeah. Um, well, that, that just hurt my feelings. No, just teasing. Um, we've offered, everybody has a handout that wants one. And... Uh, I'm, if something comes into your mind, a question or comment or whatever, write it down on your handout. And when we get to the end, we'll give you an opportunity to ask your question or make your comment if it hasn't already been answered in the flow of the lesson. Um, that's because there's some revelation that God wants to loosen this house. I said there's some revelation that God wants to loosen this house. And we want to make sure the flow of revelation is uninterrupted. Amen. Okay, this is not about this is not about pastor wanting his voice to be heard. Okay, this is about God needing His voice to be heard. All right. Now, 
Uh, so let's begin to teach. There is coming a day of judgment, a day of reckoning. It is coming. In which everyone must stand before Jesus Christ where our eternity will be determined based upon our obedience to the word of the glory, the word of God, and how we measure up to the life of Jesus Christ. Those are our two measurements. Revelation says it like this. He's going to find out if your name is in the book, and then he's going to open the books and judge you according to them. Obviously, the book of life is where our name is written down. It's what he told them to rejoice. Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life, not that the devil's subject to you. And then, of course, how have we lived our life according to the Bible? Hebrews 9 and 27, in a portion of it says, It is appointed unto men, that's mankind, once to die, but after this, the judgment. More in depth, Paul says, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, in the King James Version, I'm also going to read it in the New Living Translation, but the King James Version says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The New Living Translation says, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Now, I'm going to read it again. I don't think we connected with it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body According to that he hath done, whatever you've done, whether it be good or bad. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. I feel the animosity rise up when we talk about judging. We don't like it unless it's good. I have told you all this before. If I say, Brother Terrence, you're ugly, that's a bad judgment. If I say, Brother Terrence, you're a good-looking man, that is a good judgment. So when we say, don't judge me, we're really saying, don't judge me on the downside, only judge me on the high side. Right? I guarantee you, ain't nobody ever getting on Facebook and say, he had the audacity to tell me that I was the prettiest woman he had ever seen in his life. How dare he judge me? We ain't seen that before. But the Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter number 4, that the Lord is a righteous judge. He is a righteous judge. And we're all going to stand before him to be judged. Now, has it clicked with anybody yet what I just said to you? Maybe you might understand it better this way. Making a searching and fearless moral inventory. Ain't that crazy? Well, listen. This is a strong encouragement for everyone doing or having a step four experience in your life, which is make a searching and fearless moral inventory because it is bigger than recovery, but it is essential in preparing for eternity. How is that, you might ask? Well, the book says we're going to stand before God and be judged on what we have done in this body, whether good or bad, right or wrong, evil or excellent. Make a searching and fearless moral inventory. 
You got to do that to go to heaven, sounds like to me. Huh? Man, I should have worn me a bozo nose or something tonight and a bozo wig. Only trouble is I might like that wig enough to wear it all the time. Listen, folks. Your eternity and my eternity depends on us getting the word in us. This is not just because pastor needed to fill up 15 or 20 minutes on a Wednesday night. <laughs> okay, really. This is, this is, and we're going to get a little bit straight tonight. And God's doing a work in me where that straightness is going to come more often because you and I do not have the luxury of playing church any longer. This thing's about to wrap up. I preached to you a couple of weeks ago that by the end of the year, and I've been seeing it all over the news now. Have y'all seen it? Where you'll be able to go to Whole Foods owned by Amazon and pay for your food with your hand. In 2023, it's going to happen. Okay, that's just one sign. We, we got to get serious about this. And ever since I started teaching on the fear of God, we have had people dropping out of coming to the house of God faithful. That's not an accident. Because every time we have to come face to face with who we are, it makes us so uncomfortable that we're grown and we'll just step out. God bless you for continuing to stick with it because it's going to make a difference in your life. The power of sin keeps us from experiencing the glory of God, Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can, however, through obedience to the word of God, you notice I said through obedience to the word of God, see the power of sin destroyed in our life, Romans 6, 17 and 18. But God be thanked that you were the servant of sin but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And the next verse says, being then made free from sin. You are free from sin because you obeyed the word of God. And you now can obey the word of God. Hear me, and I, this, is not, this is not a dream, this is not a fairy tale, but when you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you now have the power to obey God in every situation. Somebody better hear me right now. You have the power to obey God and make the right decision in every situation. I do not believe that you have to sin because the Bible says sin has no more dominion over you. We got to believe that. We got to really believe that. Don't buy into this nonsense that people want to, this cheap grace that Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about that I shared with you. Don't buy into that. God expects greater things from you. You're created for greater things. Don't sell yourself out cheap. Y'all going to make me work hard tonight. I can tell already. But that's all right. I ain't scared. Look here. With sin's power destroyed, we can choose we can choose to live our lives in a manner pleasing to God, which will change our attitude that we will stand before him with in judgment. A different attitude based upon making the right decisions governed by the word of God. The beginning of the New Testament church took place in Acts chapter number 2, verses 1 through 4 on the day of Pentecost. When confronted by curious onlookers that said, what meaneth this? And mockers that said, what? These must be drunk. Peter stood up and had this to say, Acts 2, 16 and 17. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. With this outpouring, 
the message of salvation through the power of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and with obedience to that message, which is delineated in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38, the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Ghost was starting to be experienced all over the world. First day there were 3,000. A couple chapters later there were 5,000. Then persecution came and they were scattered. And then Samaritans start getting the Holy Ghost and Gentiles start receiving the Holy Ghost. And by the time Paul came around, he was touching entire provinces with the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. But as powerful as it was, as beautiful as it was, as rich as it was, it began to taper off. It began to wane. The momentum began to wane. And this is why men lost their passion for the presence of God and his glory. And once again, as has been the case since man was created, the elevation of selfish desires and feelings resulted in a depreciation of the value of God's glory and his presence. Quite honestly, they learned how to have church without God. Because religion stayed prominent. Study history. I always got a little bit concerned when we started learning in history, world history in particular, how, how much of the church, and I use that term in the widest sense, showed up throughout history. Religion stayed prominent. It's never gone away. But it was a lifeless, ritualistic religion missing the awe, reverence, and respect or the fear of the Lord. And it was replaced with the fear of people. And the people in charge promoted that and the people beneath them gave in to that simply because they lost their connection with God. It wasn't a new thing. It's happened all throughout Scripture. This apathetic disregard of God was the primary cause of Israel. I'm going to ask you again, how many reading the bread, the daily bread, let me tell you what, a whole bunch of y'all came to me and told me you wasn't reading the bread because there wasn't no papers out there. So I put a whole stack of papers out there and there still ain't no more people raise their hand reading the bread. The daily bread is our Bible reading plan where you read the Bible through on a daily section every day. But if you're reading the bread, you see that Israel absolutely rode a religious, spiritual roller coaster. I mean, like way up and down as far as their relationship with God was. They vacillated from being, I kind of like this, I came up with this myself, from being blessed into carnality. Right? Was y'all here Sunday? They went from being blessed into carnality to being oppressed into spirituality. God blessed them and they forgot about him. And when they forgot about him, the enemy started whooping on them. And when the enemy started whooping on them, guess what? They remembered the Lord. Huh? So they're just riding up this, down this roller coaster. God would bless them and when he blessed them, they would leave him to consort and become intertwined with all sorts of worldly pleasures. But after the world used them up, they would once again turn to God and they were really sorry only for the circumstances that they were in. Blessings would come and the recycle would repeat itself. Perhaps the greatest example of this, and I've heard some of you mention this, so I know you're going to connect with it. Perhaps the greatest example of this is found in the book of Judges. Now, personally, I like the book of Judges. I really like the book of Judges. I like Gideon. I like Samson. I like Jephthah. I really like Jephthah. And I like Deborah. All the ladies ought to say amen. amen. I like it. I like Judges. After the death of Moses and Joshua and the generation, the last generation born in the wilderness and the first generation to die in the promised land, 
Judges 2 and 10 says, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. They forgot about God in one generation. Children's ministry matters. I said children's ministry matters. After this, throughout Judges, God would raise up a man or a woman to lead the people. Revival and restoration would then follow, but as soon as that leader was gone, they slipped back into apostasy, followed shortly by oppression and bondage. Things continually deteriorated. With the high times getting shorter, and the low times getting longer until, and it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. I would argue, we talked about people pleasing last week. We talked about it in recovery the other night. And we've talked about it in various and sundry other times. I would argue, please hear me plainly, I would argue that there is perhaps no greater example of people pleasing than those who line up with and serve God according to their level of respect for their present pastor. I would argue that there is perhaps no greater example of people pleasing than those who line up and serve God according to their level of respect for their present pastor. And when that pastor is no longer in place, they allow their lives to deteriorate back to wherever selfish desires can take them. I have preached it. I will continue to preach it. We need a purpose-centric church, not a pastor-centric church. God have mercy. I want to live to be a hundred and something. But if I should fall dead in the morning, hopefully I have empowered you to be able to have service on the weekend. Right? Because it doesn't rotate around a person. It rotates around a purpose. Everybody connect with that, what I just said? That's why you ain't got no business using pastor to try to make your kids mind. True story. And that's why it happens all the time. And that's also why you need to live your life like Jesus is watching, not like the pastor's watching. Okay, it's still true. By the time of the end of the judges, the last, well, the last judge was really Samuel. But when Eli was the high priest, they were at an all-time low. Eli ruled and led for 40 years. And during that time, he had become spiritually and physically dilapidated. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They were hopelessly corrupt. Priest. Priest. They were having sex with the women who came to church. The women would come and assemble at the door of the church. And Hopni and Phineas were using their position of priesthood to sleep with them. They were gorging themselves. And I don't have time to go into it, but there was a three-pronged hook that the priest was allowed to reach in into the sacrifice and pull out a portion, and that was his portion. Hopni and Phineas were just taking a scoop shovel and reaching in there and getting everything they could out and gorging themselves on it. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. They were functioning according to what their flesh wanted instead of what the Word said. As a means to satisfy perverted, selfish desires. How many of you know that when you want to be turned over to let your flesh rule, God will let you? And you don't know your limits. Matter of fact, according to Romans chapter number one, you don't have any. We don't have any. 
if God turns us over. Now I want you to think about this. Y'all see what Hophni and Phinehas are doing? Desecrating the temple, stealing from God. Now let's go back to last week. We remember what happened to the sons of Aaron, right? When they offered strange fire one week after the tabernacle is opened up. What happened to them? <laughs> Through Dylan. They're tapping out. The Lord took them out. On the other hand, Eli's sons behaved much more immorally than Aaron's sons, yet they were allowed to live. Don't seem fair. Y'all remember we talked about that last week? Look at this verse, 1 Samuel 3 and 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. What do you think it means by open vision? No continual connection between man and God. You could not read the word and revelation just start flowing. There was no, matter of fact, it would appear that the work of the Lord had kind of been shoved to the back burner and the work of Eli's boys was at the forefront. The word of the Lord was precious. What do you think that means? Rare. Kind of like precious stones. Okay, what's that? Yep, they like to have had it, but not everybody had the connection. Now, in the case of Aaron's sons, what had happened one week before they messed up? Y'all remember? I'm trying to do. I'm trying to stay connected with us tonight. All right. Does anybody remember what happened to Aaron's sons? They died. All for strange fire. Do you remember what happened a week before that? Seven days before that? The glory of God came down and filled the tabernacle to the point that nobody could even go in it. So, Aaron's boys, the glory had just been revealed in a way it had never been revealed before. In the case of Hopni and Phineas, there was no open vision. Their knowledge of the word had become nothing, and there was not a freedom of knowing the word, so thereby they had no avenue where to experience the glory of God. Now, judgment did come for Hopni and Phineas, but it was delayed. With the greater revelation of the glory of God comes swifter and more pronounced judgment. The New Testament says it like this, to whom much is given, much is required. When God's glory is limited or prohibited, the darkness remains without confrontation and judgment is delayed. But look at this in 1 Timothy 5 and 24 in the New Living Translation. Turn to your neighbor and say, uh-oh, Remember, the sins of some people are obvious, and I'm in the New Living Translation, leading them to certain judgment. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed till later. What does that mean? Somebody say that to me in Southeast Missouri vernacular. You better stop playing. Y'all remember in recovery some weeks ago when I said, y'all better stop trying to run a hustle all the time on everything and everybody. That's what it's saying right there. Huh? That's what it's saying right there. We got to stop playing games. Ananias and Sapphira's irreverence for God and their increased reverence for the opinion of people took place in the glow of the glory. The Holy Ghost has just been poured out. 
It's a new revelation. It's a new manifestation of the power of God. It's fresh, it's powerful, and it's, it's beautiful, and it's big. And it, oh, my Lord. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. You remember what Peter said to him in 2 and 39? For the promises unto you and to your children and to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That means it's available for everybody. How does that compare and contrast to Hop 9 Phineas? There was no open vision. There was no declaration of the word. Nobody just had, there wasn't nobody doing no preaching. But Ananias and Sapphira were taken out because they had no excuse. The glory was completely made known and available. Uh oh. In the powerful light of the outpouring of the early or the former rain, Ananias and Sapphira lied to God, and the judgment was equal to that. Now, the danger of dallying around in cloudy revelation and delayed judgment is, here's what we think. Well, I did that, and nothing happened, so I must be safe to do as I please. God's word must not mean what it says. I must be exempt from God's judgment, so it must not really matter. This, ladies and gentlemen, come on, Holy Ghost, help me, is a picture of the religious world in which we live. People comforted by a false understanding of what grace really is, and they mistake the delay of God's judgment for the denial of it. And that is a mistake that has eternal ramifications. There will be people, Jesus said this, and this is not in my notes. Jesus said that there will be people come and say unto him, Lord, Lord, hadn't we cast out devils in your name? We've healed the sick in your name. We've done many wonderful works in your name. And he will say to them, Oh, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I don't know about you. That scares me. That shakes me up. Because that is not a statement talking about sinners. Because dirty, rank, rotten, willful sinners ain't going around talking about how good the Lord is. They're trying to hide from him. The lamp of God has grown dim. But God is raising up a church of misfits and outcasts who are not afraid to pursue God into the fullness of redemption's message and purpose, to preach truth without fear or favor, declaring unto the church the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the message of Jesus Christ, his first words were, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was the opening statement of his earthly ministry and that call still resonates. Make no mistake, the call to follow Jesus Christ always has and always will be built upon repentance which is death to yourself. The call to judgment is plain. What is also plain, that to remain ignorant of God's glory will not protect you from judgment. Look what Paul said in Acts 17, 30 and 31. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. You, I'm going to say this again. I say it all the time because I have had people come and accuse me of talking down to them when I said ignorant. I am not calling you ignorant. Ignorant has only taken on a negative connotation as a personal insult in the last few years. Ignorance simply means I don't know. Okay? At the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness 
by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. What's the scripture telling us? It's telling us he's appointed. There's a day coming. There is an appointed day coming in which God will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ. But he's given everybody assurance when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That pull you feel, that longing you've had, nothing is going to satisfy it except Jesus Christ. That holy discomfort that was invading your life before you ever showed up here, nothing's going to satisfy that except the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ occupying residence inside of you. The reason for that is Everybody feels that longing. Everybody feels that emptiness because you and I were created for his purpose. Can I get an amen or something? You were created for his purpose. The devil wants us to become apathetic and the devil wants us to become distracted. The devil been trying to distract me all day right up until church time. The reason is and the reason why the last two or three weeks we've struggled to stay connected is because this stuff is important. And we've given the, oh, help me right now, Holy Ghost. We've given the devil too much traction in our mind and in our hearts and in our lives that we don't really know how to get rid of him. But the Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. We've got to make up in our mind, I'm going to get this stuff and I'm going to get the word put down in my heart. I will hide his word in my heart that I might not sin against God. I want to be holy and I want to be pure and I want to be complete and I want to be effective and I want to be able to do the work of the Lord in this world that he put me in. I want it. Please understand, I'm not preaching for attaboys. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. I don't really need your amens, but I need you to be connected. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by him and for him. If you're doing anything else than your created purpose, you're not going to be complete, happy, and fulfilled. I, I, forgive me, this is not meant to be political, but you will not get a medal for just being here. If you want that, go sign up for Little League. Your salvation is not based on the horseshoes and hand grenade principle. Brother Shannon, I would argue that Agrippa's words in the book of Acts are the saddest in Scripture. There are two passages in Scripture to me that break my heart when I hear them. One of them is Esau found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And the second one is when Agrippa told Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You were created for him, for his purpose, for his plan. In the beginning was the word, the logos. You were in that. All right. Moving on up. Paul wrote a letter to Timothy a young pastor, young preacher, and his protege. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And he said, This know also that in the last days 
it's going to get tough. Perilous times, by definition, means very difficult. If you don't have something above the just run-of-the-mill relationship, you ain't going to make it. Because the Bible, there we go. I felt, who do you think you are judging me? The Bible says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where do the ungodly and the sinner appear? It's going to, Holy Ghost, it's going to be a war with your flesh until the trumpet sounds. In the last days, perilous times, difficult, dangerous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. That means love money more than anything. Boasters. Bragging about nothing. Oh, my Lord. So what? If you got 347,000 likes on your last picture. Don't tell me that you don't pull up Facebook after you post something to see how many people liked it. <laughs> see how many people viewed it. And exactly what does that get you? Why does it matter so much to us? Because the Bible says boasters. You know what it means? Empty bragging. Bragging about nothing. A great big old balloon filled of nothing. All is vanity, the preacher said in Ecclesiastes. They're going to be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Literally means abusers. They're going to just abuse people and mistreat people. Disobedient to parents. I don't care what the world says. Make your kids mine. It's your responsibility. And it's hard work. I said it's difficult. It's hard work. Because they're ornery. You were too. But it's a sign of the end time. And the reason is, is the government, and maybe not the government, just society as general has decided you ain't supposed to get on to your kids no more. Even though the Bible teaches that you are. Tell you what my boy did. He's here tonight named Garrison. <laughs> Told me he was going to call child abuse. <laughs> you know what I told him? Give me a couple minutes before you call him because I'm going to give you something to really tell him. And then I'm going to call them for you. We came around to daddy's way of thinking. Listen, it ain't cute to have ornery kids. Don't laugh at them when they curse and say ugly things. It ain't funny. Wash their mouth out with soap when they call people ugly names. Well, I, just, I must have a whole bunch of grandmas and grandpas in here or something. We're in the Bible, and it's connected to the fear of God because this is a sign of dangerous times. Well, uh, what about the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast ain't going to have no job to do if we don't get the... We're going to tear it down ourselves. All right, I'll move on. Unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, that means cold, unfeeling, empty, no compassion, no connection. Truce breakers. You know what that means? Can't get along with nobody. False accusers. You know what that means? Slanderous gossipers. Repeating stories you don't know if it's true or not. Stop sharing every cotton-picking thing you get on social media. You don't know if that's true. Oh, here he goes again, messing with my Facebook and my Instagram and my TikTok and my hoochie coochie.
whatever that they come up with a new one every day. I, I don't know what all they are. But ladies and gentlemen, we got to get this right. We got to get this right. I'm really just saying I don't know what all of them social media things are. I can't keep up with them. Incontinent, you know what that means? It does not mean you can't hold your bathroom. Somebody tried to say that one time. It means you don't have no self-control. I'm telling you the truth. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Jealous, envy. Traitors. Heady. Heady means you don't have no governor in your life. Reckless, impulsive, high-minded. That means arrogant and conceited. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That means your life is out of order. Now I want you to notice this. I still don't know what I said. That was so crazy. I've been saying that since who flung the chunk. I guess it got a new meaning. I'm going to have to be more careful. i got to run my stuff by my kids before I say it. Here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Paul ain't warning Timothy about the world. He's warning him about the church. Because look at the next verse. having a form of godliness, a type of religion, a type of an experience. They promote themselves as Christian, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. He's not describing the society in which Timmy will, Timothy will live and the society in which the last days will, will be indicative of, but he's describing it to the church having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Give me that in the New Living Translation. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Oh, and then it says, by the way, stay away from people like that. And all the codependents in the house say, oh, no. They need me. I got to help them. How's that working out for you? I mean, really. The power that makes us holy, the power that changes us, the power that's rejected is found in the same place you found the Holy Ghost. Amazing grace. The grace of God saves you, for by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, Ephesians chapter 2. But it's also the place you find the ability to become holy, like Jesus. The message of salvation has to be a... The message of salvation has to be a strong balance of the goodness of God along with the fear of God. Because listen to this. Serving only a good God results in spoiled, rotten Christian brats whose only reason for living, only reason for coming to church is when it suits them, when it satisfies them, or when it entertains them. I read this today, and I had it in my notes, but I took it out. But I'm going to tell you. Anybody heard of Francis Chan? Anybody heard of Francis Chan? He's got some incredible books, and he, he's pretty, a pretty incredible man. He was pastoring a church in Simi Valley, California, that ran 8,000-ish people, a mega church, the only one in that region. And he showed up to church one day, and he resigned just out of the blue, and he quit. And here's what he told him the reason for quitting was. He said, 
if Jesus Christ came and preached at the church three blocks away from us, y'all would still come to this one because we entertain you better. And I'm sick of being in the entertainment business. That's what Francis Chan said. We need to shake ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, and ask ourselves, exactly what am I doing here? Not just here, but here. Why am I even living here? Why do I exist for the kingdom of God? I'm going to have to wrap it up if I'm going to give you all a chance to talk a minute, but just stay with me just a second. Serving God, serving a God, only a good God, results in us being spoiled, rotten brats whose only reason for living is to serve ourselves. And serving a God we fear results in only having a performance-based relationship with God that we cannot hope to maintain. You have to have a balance between the goodness of God and the fear of God. Grace has been diminished by many to only cover up our lack of commitment. Establishing a church only interested in maintaining what they have rather than in pursuing more. Be Bevere says this, John Bevere, who wrote the book, The Fear of the Lord, that we're teaching from, he said, grace is not an excuse, it's empowerment. A poor understanding of grace has led us to a place where the lifestyle of Christian folk living under the Christian banner cannot be told apart from those that don't believe in anything at all. This results in us feeling a complete liberty to disobey God whenever it's convenient for us or whenever the word of God is contrary to our desire to fit in with the world. We can just disobey God because of his grace. Somebody somewhere so perverted the message of grace until many believers have faith in a God that wants to make them happy rather than holy. Grace does not cover Excuse me, grace does cover, but it's not a cover-up. It covers for the purpose of enabling us and empowering us to go beyond our sinful failures, our past, our messed up lives, living a life of holiness and obedience unto God's word and the leading of his spirit. Hebrews 12 and 28, and I'm going to wrap it up and give you about 10 minutes. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Grace is the avenue whereby we are saved and whereby we serve him with reverence and godly fear. In his letter to Titus, another young preacher, pastor, and protege of Paul's, he writes this in Titus 2, 11, and 15, 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, look at here, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. What does iniquity mean? Lawlessness, no structure, do whatever you want to. He redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. And what does that word peculiar mean? Only for him. A people set apart only for him. And a people that are excited, zealous of good works. And look what he says to Titus. These things speak, that's preach it, exhort, that's edify, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. 
How does that work with people pleasing? All right, I got a few more things, but I'm going to call it a night. Anybody have anything wrote down they want to ask? Kevin? Okay. Yep. Uh huh. Um, no, but you're in a dangerous place because the Bible says every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. What you've got to do is what I do. When dumbness rise up in my mind, y'all know what I mean by that? I start telling myself, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. When my, thought, when my thoughts conflict with what I know about God, I got to get them out of my mind. Because Max Lucado says, and I agree, I'm the air traffic controller of my mind. I can't stop stupid from flying over, but I don't have to let it land. All right? Yep. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah, so what's your question? Uh-uh. Fear of people is when you do things to please people and say rain on what the Lord wants. You do things to make people happy. We talked about that last week, remember? Ananias and Sapphira, they sold a piece of property and they got a whole bunch of money, but they only gave part of the money and they told the church they gave all the money. Because they wanted everybody to think they were cool. They wanted to be a part of the cool kids, sit at the cool kids' table in the lunchroom. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? That's people pleasing, and they violated the law of God in order to please people. <laughs> and you don't say amen, so I don't know that. Yeah. Anybody else, real quickly? Good, stand with us. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Sunday morning at uh, 10 o'clock is Elements class. At 11 o'clock, don't forget Brother Mike Burke will be preaching. Uh, he lives in Bernie, Missouri, 10th Church in Poplar Bluff. He's an evangelist. He's a power pack. He will pray people through to the Holy Ghost. You haven't ever received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? You got somebody that needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Bring them with you. Bring them with you Sunday morning. Brother Burke's an evangelist, and he is gifted. And God uses him. So we want you to be there for that. If you can't, please come. Bring a good offering. We want to be a blessing to him. Amen? Amen. Any other announcements? Oh, I forgot about it. Yeah. You, you, share it on Brother Kevin's Facebook page. You got that? I love Kevin. Oh, yeah. 12 hours of prayer Saturday. Fill up that paper. It's over here on the, the table as you're walking out the door. Especially if you've never prayed one hour, please come and pray. We, we all pray at the church. The church is open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we need people here praying. Amen? Amen? Please fill it up. Who had their hand up? Oh, that was it. That was it. All right, let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for this night. Thank you for this incredible people.
Thank you for hungry folks that show up on a Wednesday night to learn more about you. Lord, I want to know more about you. I want to grow in you. I want the fear of God to be active in my life. I want to respect you above all else. I want to revere you above all else. You are the only true God. I owe my life to you. Everything I have, I owe it to you, Lord. So I want to put you at the place that you belong in my life. Help me to do that. Help me learn to love you more, appreciate you more, and value you more, not less. I want you to rise up in my life. Keep everybody safe going home. Bring us all back this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.